Hello, good evening. It's good to see you here on Ghana Tonight. I'm Kemini Amano. Let's take a look at our top stories this hour. Tonight, we're following the flood of promises targeted at voters as the elections draw near. We are getting to the bottom of some of the promises made and help you make a decision. Also, we are keeping the pressure on illegal and unethical mining. Tonight, we'll bring you new information on that brazen mining in the Asenanya Forest Reserve in the Ashanti region. Check this. 22 Ghanaians aim for the top job in Ghana. Tonight, we'll pick apart the list as the Electoral Commission ends filing of nominations. I've got to tell you the numbers in the presidential race. This election uh, looks very, or look very interesting. I'll tell you more about that in the chat. But in order, in order for you to be part of the conversation and show that you're watching us uh, on Facebook at TV3 Ghana, YouTube at TV3 Ghana, and interact with your comments with the hashtag Ghana Tonight. Let's settle for Ghana Brief. The Judicial Service says the parties involved in two cases pending at the court with regards to the anti-LGBT bill have not completed the work they are supposed to undertake to enable the court to hear the matter. This is the Judicial Service's rejoinder to a story published on August 15, 2024. In that publication, sponsor of the anti-LGBT bill, Sam George, stated that the Chief Justice was acting maliciously in that the Supreme Court deferred its ruling on the injunction applications. This, he argued, will delay passage of the bill into law. The Judicial Service in its rejoinder offers the following explanation. For the Richard Sky case, the Judicial Service explains that at the time the court went on recess, neither Parliament nor the Attorney General had filed a defence to the plaintiff's action. This, the service says, means the court cannot hear the case. For the Amando Doi case, the service says the Attorney General has not filed its statement of defence. The parties are also to file a joint or individual memorandum random of issues to enable the Supreme Court hear the case. The paramount chief of the Nandam traditional area, now Professor Edmond Dele, says he has no faith in the government's five-member interministerial committee set up to look into the illegal mining. According to the former chairman of the Convention People's Party, CPP, the committee is partisan and therefore will not come out with any good recommendation. He has therefore joined the call for a total ban on small-scale mining. I personally don't think they can do, even if they have the best suggestions, but it's also partisan. I wanted a non-partisan committee, for instance. NDC should have had it. There are people there. Get other people so that when we come out with a decision, which is non-partisan, I always believe that when we have trouble, like war, there is no NDC, there is no NPP. It's only Ghana. Politicians from both the ruling New Patriotic Party and the National Democratic Congress are involved in Galamse, and that is why it is difficult to fight the menace head on. These are the words of the Member of Parliament for Asen Central, Kennedy Japong, who believes until politicians sacrifice and stop, water bodies will continue to be polluted and the environment destroyed. The politicians are informed. I'm bold to tell you because nobody can point to them at all. Kanaku has done a lot to stop this, but I'm afraid both sides and this MPP from positionally level to the top. 
Member of Parliament for Ningo Pram Pram, Sam Nati George, says any further delays by President Okufuado in assenting to the anti-LGBTQ plus bill would be perceived as an indication that the president is in favor of homosexuality. Sam George, one of the main sponsors of the bill, made these remarks during a press conference calling on the president to take decisive action. If the two leading flag bearers, his Excellency John Dramani Mahama and His Excellency Mahmoud Baumia have stated emphatically that they will sign the bill. If we are seeing a delay in the courts, it will suggest that President Akufuado supports homosexuality, is in favor of homosexuality, and that's why he's running away from signing the bill. Chairperson of the National Commission for Civic Education, Kathleen Adi, is urging Ghanaians to vote against politicians who use intemperate language in the lead up to the 2024 election. In a yet to be aired interview on hot issues, the NCCE board stressed that Ghanaians have a role to play in churning out responsible leaders. We must begin to punish wrong behavior through how we reward politicians. Because at the end of the day, Politicians are not inherently bad people or some evil people. Mm -hmm. They're us. When people are misbehaving, then we are giving them fans, so to speak, right? We are hailing them. Mm -hmm. We are giving them front row seats. We are repeating their negative energy. We are giving them platforms to do even more. What would be the motivation for them to stop? Gonna brief there for you. If you have just joined us, you are in time for our big stories tonight. Final nomination officially closes for the 2024 elections. And tonight we see who didn't make it and what's next on the electoral calendar. Tonight, we're learning nearly two dozen men and women vie for the top job in Ghana. The list has shot 11 other people who could not file their nominations before the Electoral Commission closed nominations for both the presidential and parliamentary uh, candidates. Of the 22 candidates, there are 10 political parties in the race uh, for president and of peculiar interest, 12 independent candidates in the name of democracy, they all want to be president. Just one spot to fill. How does this number compare to the last election? I'll tell you. I take a look at what's coming up on your screen really critically because 17 candidates filed nominations in the 2020 elections. Five candidates less than this year because this year is 22. Ironically, only 12 made it to the ballot as five candidates were disqualified. Now, clearly, the number of independent candidates has curiously shot up by nine. In the last election, only three independent candidates filed nomination and only one made it to the, to the ballot. Uh, the numbers could have been, uh, but some aspirants, excuse me, could not make it in good time uh, to meet the deadline. Well, uh, in a bit, we'll talk to one of the political parties who could not make you know, the, the deadline for the filing of nomination. In the meantime, I want to take you through the list of the people who were able to, the 22 uh, you know, candidates who were able to file nominations. Let's start off with uh, the independent candidates. I told you earlier, in this election, there are 12 of them, much more, or many more, excuse me, than uh, political parties. Nana Kwame Bedia, Konyu Force, Samuela Pia, Dankwa, George Shum, Berima. Uh, let's move on to the next slide of independent candidates real quick. We also know, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that... We also know Kofi Kranting, Alan Tremanting, uh, Janet Asana Nabla, who is, who is not an independent candidate uh, necessarily because she left the PNC to form the PNP.
but we know also know that uh, one of the few one of the few women, Nana Stevens, uh, in, in the race, Desmond Abrefa, Elder Paul Perko, and then the last slide of uh, you know the tw the twelve independent candidates will see Dr. Sam Ankara, uh, John Kwipi, and James Kwesi Opong. Those are the independent candidates in the race. Shall we see the political parties in the race? We know John Dramani Mahama of the NDC has also filed nominations. The NPP's flag bearer, Dr. Mahama Dubaomia, has also filed his nominations. The flag bearer of the APC, Dr. Hassan Ayariga, has done the same. Kofi Akpalu of LPG has also filed his nomination. Christian Kwabna Andrews of the Ghana Union Movement has also filed his nomination. Alhaji Mohammed uh, Frimpong of NDP, uh, the party that came out of uh, Nana Konedu, who was then with the NDC. They've also filed a candidate. Ikuya Donko, Ghana Freedom Party, has filed a candidate. The CPP that struggled a little bit before, you know, going to Congress is also filed the candidate Nanakosia from Poma Sapon Kuma Kuma, uh, a former chairman of the party. Bernard Mona, uh, the PNC uh, candidate for the 2024 elections. Just a, a few more and then we wrap up. Dr. Daniel Augustus Lati of GCPP also filed nominations. But as we said earlier, I'm going to bring in the national chair of the Progressive People's Party, PPP, Nana Ofori Owusu, on why their names do not appear on our list of political parties that have managed to file nominations as it was closed today. Uh, Nana, good evening to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Is there a reason you're not on the list? Uh, I am shocked to hear this in the news. Because we have found filed a candidature in the person of Kofi Asamoah We were slated to present around three o'clock. We were on the premises of the Electoral Commission. There is a, 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 a book at the um, security that we all signed our names in that book. We entered the EC. Uh, I met Deputy Commissioner um, Bosman. Um, we were in the reception. We met the other parties there. We waited from 3 o'clock to about 5.30 in the reception. And we entered to give our documents uh, nicely binded. We've been doing this for some time. I personally have been Director of Operations from the PPP 2012-2016, I've stood as parliamentary candidate. I've been director of operations. I've been chairman. I understand the rudiments of, of filing. Mm. If you recall, 2016, when the EC wronged us and we went to court, they reinstated us. I so see. So there is not, there's absolutely nothing Very well. that we did. And, and the reportage, I'm not sure it's an easy reportage because oh, from what we were well, told... Well, Nana, Nana, let's, let's go back to, you know, events that took place when the PPP attempted to file its, its nominations. Uh, you recall that okay. the Electoral Commission had made or, or made their concerns about the timing known. Let's take a listen to, to that. We'll come back to our conversation. We are not expected to receive nominations after five. The premises of the EC is not where we complete nomination forms. Candidates are expected to complete their nomination forms and uh, file within the stipulated time. We are not going to accept it, we will receive it, but we are not going to accept the forms. 
I am acting on behalf of the chairperson who is the returning officer. So I will submit my report to the chairperson of the electoral commission who happens to be the returning officer. The returning officer. Don't worry, so you, once you send the report to the returning officer, so this issue yes. will be taken on it. So you submit it officially, so you will receive it. Yeah. Nana, so what we hear is that, you know, they have received it, but a decision has not been taken as to whether or not it's been accepted. As we speak at the moment, have you heard anything from the Electoral Commission that the forms uh, that you submitted uh, have been accepted? Well, we, we, have, we are looking forward to the Electoral Commission reviewing the documents as they review all other documents bringing, if there are any errors, to our attention to correct, as they have offered all the other candidates. You should have played what we said back to him when he made these comments. Oh. First of all, he said that they don't accept com uh, uh, documents after 5.30. Mm -hmm. Is it our problem that we were sitting in the conference room and you were talking to other candidates when it was 5 o'clock? Did they bring everybody into the room at 5 o'clock to say, hand in your documents? We were in the premises, signed in their own book at 3 o'clock. If he says we were working on documents or fixing documents, did they see us writing on any documents? But, because but this Nana, document if you had been were, there from were, 3 o'clock, uh, what stopped you from filing your nominations? No, no, no. What I'm saying, there were people before us. Somebody had just left the room around uh, a minute before we entered. We could not have rushed the room while other candidates were there. We entered immediately after the, the, the person uh, before us had left. Then we entered immediately. Meanwhile, prior to that time, we were sitting in the conference room. And then they came to lock the door. The commissioner came and gave directives to lock the door while we were in the premises. Our vehicles were in the premises. The main door that had been locked, all the people that came after, I, see. I, I imagine, were behind the door. We were all inside. I, so I, what is being said is, 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 is my, my, to, 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 if that's what is being said, then it's a, it's a I it's see. Funny. So, so Nana, in the absence of any new information because from... Because complied. Mm, in the absence of any new information from the Electoral Commission, the PPP, uh, is, it, it does not appear that PPP was able to successfully file its nomination. What are the next steps for the party? No, no, it's what... It, uh, we have not heard anything officially from them. We... We are waiting to hear from them. You know that the PPP, if you wrong the PPP, will see you in court. Mm, I because see. the guidelines in which was given, the guidelines that were given and provided to us, we obeyed it in total. Our name in their own books that they put at the front for us to sign, our name and time, and organization that we are coming from, our names are in there. We signed it. We were... We have our documentations with us, nicely, neatly binded, mm. four copies. We have been doing this as a political party from 2012 to date. There is nothing that is new to us in that process. And we are binded by every single regulation. The 530 that he speaks of, I Very am well. surprised. Because people have lined up and you are calling them one by one. And if you are calling them one by one, and our time is not up, and you have not called us to enter, and the time you call us to enter is 5.30, is, is but we are the premises at 3. Does it stand to reason that you can say that you will not accept our document? Mm, I see. This, 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 it's not possible. I am saying that these things that you are saying, after or sober reflection, we will, we will hear something different. Mm. So we are, uh, we, we, we'll keep our we fingers are, crossed for that. But you mentioned that Kofi Asamoah uh, one time general secretary of your party, is uh, the candidate that the PPP chose. Uh, we know that for a long time the PPP has gone with a female candidate, 
people were expecting the same. Talk to us about where Bridget places in your party today. Bridget is the member of National Committee. She's still a strong member of the National Committee of the Progressive People's Party. Kofi Asamoah was the running mate in 2020. Mm -hmm. and, and decisions, and the two of them, decisions have been taken. And this time, it is Kofi Asamoah that is going mm. for 2024. Looks like he's been given an upgrade. Of, no, no, no. Kofi Asamoah is a brilliant chap. He has been part of the people who have been writing our policy documents. He's part of the people that have led this party, great organizer. He has competed as a member of parliament for Akim Odan constituency mm. 2016. He has a strong pedigree in the political space. Very well, Nana. And that. Nana, we can only wish uh, the PPP well. Hopefully, uh, the Electoral Commission speaks to this matter and, and that's so soon. Thank you so much. Nana Ofori Owusu is chairman of the PPP. Also joining the conversation is the executive director of Global Info Analytics, Musa Dankwa. I want to have a conversation about the numbers we're seeing particularly, you know, zooming in on the number of independent candidates who have filed their nominations. Uh, Musa, good evening to you. Thank you so much for staying up for us. But are you surprised by the number of independent candidates who have been able to file nominations or shown interest in, in the presidency? Um, Kamini, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm not surprised. Because if you look at um, what happened in the last people's elections, I think there were three independent candidates. And this time around, we have a lot of them. I think they realized that running as independent candidate is the easiest vehicle to get into the ballot uh, paper because you don't have to go through a whole lot of uh, loops with regard to party machinery to be able to get that. So I wasn't quite surprised that I saw uh, that number. Mm. In words, almost over a year ago, we've seen couple being there for a long time. But the level at which uh, they have filed probably is surprising. They were quite uh, confident they would get to the ballots. Mm. I see. But do the numbers you see support, you know, the probability of the country, you know, having an independent candidate for president? That is a far fetch at the moment. Um, it's still NDC and MPP uh, in the top two. But we're not going to see the same level of performance among the independent parties or smaller parties compared to the previous elections. Because we have seen a bit of uh, high numbers being recorded by two leading candidates uh, among the lot, which is Alan Chen Martin and Anna Kwan Bidiako. For this reason, I think they will do far better than they have done in the past. Mm, I see. So, I mean, in, in, in other words, another way of looking at it is for democracy, this is good. But in actual sense, these 12 independent candidates who are racing for uh, presidency are, you know, on a fruitless venture, so to speak. Some of them, I think they're doing it just for their CVs, uh, just to say that they have been a, a candidate in Ghana's election. Uh, they know they will not get so much, but maybe they want to be known, uh, maybe for the next uh, uh, chapter of their lives. Um, they want to come back really 2028, 2022. So the, the, the process starts now. So some of them, I think that's the reason why they are, they are contesting. The flip side of this is that we have more political parties who have filed nominations this year uh, compared to, well, s you know, slightly higher than that of, uh, uh, you know, the la elections of the last four years. Um, these political parties, what do the numbers say about their chances? Uh, do the numbers support the existence? If you look at the numbers we have seen so far, the independent party, uh, candidates are doing better than their parties, except MPP and ND NDC. So this time around, we're going to see the independent candidates doing a lot more better than the parties that have been well established. And that, I think, will be manifested in the outcome of the elections. Really? You, you think so? 
that some of the independent candidates could be doing better than the established political parties? Yeah, I mean, that's what the facts uh, on the ground suggest. I mean, if you look at Alan Chamartin, Nana Kwambi, they are, are running as independent candidates. And between two of them, they are doing a lot more than the, all the parties put together. So we're not expecting to see anything uh, different from what we have seen in the polling numbers. Mm, I see. Uh, you, there's always been the conversation about a third force to break the duopoly of NPP and NDC. Do you see that happening with this election? At the moment, the poll numbers are not suggest so. Um, not sure what we have in store in the next few months that we have before we go to elections. But the trend has been quite steady. Um, uh, I don't think the third force would be a very, very formidable force right now mm. uh, because of the unique circumstances we find ourselves in. Uh, very well. Uh, thank you so much, Musa Wudiva here. I appreciate you talking to us. Musa Dankwa is Executive Director of Global Info Analytics. But what's next after this? The Deputy Commissioner of the Electoral Commission in charge of corporate services, Dr. Eric Bosman Asari, spoke to our course B. Annan. This week we are going to come up with those who have qualified and those who didn't meet the requirements. After that, then the team in charge will work on balloting for positions. And once we do the balloting, it will replicate at the constituency level. So assuming, uh, let's say, uh, one of the parties will pick uh, position one, automatically, where you, if you are contesting the parliamentary in that particular constituency too, you become one. So all those processes will follow. Then once we also have a final register, we print it, then we have the notice of poll, which will, be, which will indicate the people who are contesting the presidential election as well as the parliamentary elections in the various constituencies. So in terms of the nomination, everything is on course. But we know who the candidates are, at least those who have filed their nominations and interest in the presidential race. But who's promising what? And who should you believe? We've got you covered tonight. Now, it's 85 days more to the December polls, which means that it's that time of the year where politicians are known to promise citizens heaven and earth, sometimes in a shameless attempt to woo the same voters. They made perhaps same promises too, but never fulfilled them. And this week, we have had some rather interesting ones, like the ones I'm about to show you. This one. If you, Nananum, desire for your children to travel to America to work and send money back home, or if you are a young person eager to explore opportunities abroad, I promise to support you when I become MP. And that's Pius Enam Hajide, uh, NPP parliamentary candidate for Isu Jaman. And then there's another one I want to show you. Also, one of those bizarre promises that we have heard uh, the season of the elections. Take a look. I am the chairman of the Ghana Gas Company. If you don't vote for the NPP, we will not construct the AstroTurf for you. That's coming from uh, Kennedy Japon. Uh, he also says that you always receive the development you ask for, yet you go to the ballot and vote for the NDC. If you don't vote for the NPP, we won't bring development here. Why is this eerily familiar? Because the president has also said this before, something very similar along those lines. But what you just saw is a quote from Kennedy in Japan as he was campaigning uh, somewhere in this country. I am almost certain uh, that you have also had a few more wherever you are watching us from. But let's get into it and better understand campaign message. And I'm going to bring in now uh, Professor Kobi Mensa, who is the political marketing strategist. Uh, let's have a conversation as to what you are hearing today, how to break down what you're hearing and understand 
the decisions that you make thereafter. Uh, Prof, good evening to you. Many thanks for joining us. The political parties obviously are in full swing, campaign mood, and one of the key things that drives uh, this period is the message de you know, they deliver. First off, what makes for an effective campaign message? Uh, Kevin, thank you very much. Uh, when it comes to campaign messages, we craft them based on a number of you know, uh, factors. One, uh, and the most essential, you're looking at the needs, and I should qualify that the legitimate needs of the people. Now, when you consider the legitimate needs of the people, you also craft it in the ideological, you know, leanings of the party. And the reason why I'm actually stressing on that is that, obviously, needs can be satisfied by different ways. So you realize that political parties will do research, they will gain the needs of the people. But when it comes to preferring the solutions, they will come from two different angles or three different angles, depending on the number of political parties and how they want to solve. So you realize that when we talk about free SHS, whereas Nanado was actually talking about, you know, getting the people into the schools immediately, the NEC were actually hammering on progressive free, where they were actually explaining that you need a certain infrastructure base before you actually push the people into it. And so, your key, two key factors that you want to consider in crafting a political message is about the legitimate needs of the people and then supported or underpinned by the ideological positions of the political party in, a, in order to advance what you think will be you know, uh, the most persuasive message uh, to the people that you actually targeted. Indeed, so Prof. that's what you can actually consider as a campaign message. Very well. I'd like to believe that you had some of the, you know, the promises that we have had this week, uh, including the promise to take children of constituents abroad, uh, promises to facilitate exits, as, as we recently heard, among others. Would you say our politicians are doing well enough so far? I think that it's... It's really strange. I mean, and it's not only this election. I mean, there had been quite a number of, you know, uh, campaign message positions that people sort of have been taken aback about. All right. Obviously, uh, people talk about sloganeering. Uh, it's not a bad thing. It's about how would people really understand your campaign message and retain it. But then it becomes bad when it becomes just a slogan, but not fulfillment. And so it becomes, you know, what people call it as sloganeering. And now if you look at this particular election, it is no longer sloganeering, but bizarre, you know, kind of position of what people actually, you know, offer. In fact, to some extent, some of these, you know, offerings that the political so some politicians are actually offer not to even think about the illegality of it to say, oh, I took some people to Australia, I can take some people, you know, the same way I can take people to, to uh, what do you call the US. And then you come and say, oh, I can get to exit, you know, that kind of thing. It's, it's almost as if people think that they can promise you know, almost anything in order that they can actually get elected, including illegal, you know, offerings. And I think it is very, very strange. You know, elsewhere, I think the political party itself would strike, you know, the rod. Uh, they, could, they could actually discipline such a, a candidate, you know, uh, they could rebuke the candidate, so to speak. But here's the case, candidates actually promising almost illegality and they are going scot-free. A friend of mine actually asked me, where some of these human resource of this political party were actually gotten from. It's so strange that they could actually promise illegality and then nothing happens. Nobody actually rebukes them, et cetera. Well, so yeah, it's very strange in this particular election. Well, that's kind of... an interesting question your friend asks, but uh, what could be the reason for some of these bizarre and as you have identified uh, promises based on illegality? I think that uh, some people are actually blaming the voters, saying that, well, it's because 
that is what you know they want to hear. But I take a different view. I think it's a desperation of the political you know uh, elite. I mean, you know, leadership is a call to action, a call to legitimize you know uh, uh, a certain statuses, and then uh, you, you want to actually demonstrate your ability to actually get the national king to your people. All right. So leaders must know better, even if the followers do not know. And that's why we are given a certain privileges. I tell people that, look, it behoves on leaders to behave, not the followers to behave, all right? Otherwise, we'll not give you privileges. So the followers know that they have limitations. As a result, they've given you the mandate to lead them, and they've given you privileges as a result of that, so that you could get the most, or you can be in the most comfortable position to help them reach their goals, reach their development goals, all right? And so you have the mandate and you have the core responsibility to behave, even if the followers are not behaving, that's why they give you the, 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 the mandate. And so for, for, uh, for leaders to actually give some, some kind of bizarre promises, mm. hoping that they could use that to lure the voters, I think that is very, very you know, distasteful. I think that it's it's very uncalled for, all right? Mm, and it well. smacks of a, a certain desperation to get power at any means. Mm. And I'm very happy that the voters are seeing through that. And if you, you know, look at the case in point, which I just you know, highlighted, the constituents have been interviewed and people say, we know that he's lying. We know that he's saying anything for us to. And that's Please. a big, big you know, applause to... Very well. And, and, and you know, Prof, there are those who have equated the quality of the message to the quality of the politician based on what you have seen with the trend so far. Would you consider them of low quality? Absolutely. They're empty. They're empty. That's why they, they would actually go down the route. They, uh, the route. they don't know what politics means. They don't understand what leadership means. They don't actually appreciate the fundamental orientation of your own political party. If you do, you would have a lot more sensible things to say. I mean, there are quite a lot of you know, com uh, compelling or pertinent issues that you could talk about, all right? But because they're empty, they cannot, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it? They cannot appreciate and they cannot understand what it is that the voters will look up to to vote for them. You know, sometimes we equate you know, uh, what do you call or growing up to leadership, you know? And so by the fact that you see somebody is a grown up, the person is actually entered into a certain status, we think that, you know, by by virtue of that, they should be sensible, uh, sorry to use that word, or by virtue of that, they should, they should be able to appreciate what is right, what is legitimate, et cetera. No. There are quite a lot of people who have just grown without appreciating legitimacy, without appreciating what is right, et cetera. And so such people, you would actually give them that benefit of the doubt, you know, at your own peril. You have to query them. And once you start querying them, you realize that, no, they're not up to that level that you're anticipating that they should be. And so, you know, the political parties, I always say that they are the channels through which we recruit leadership for this country. And that's why, for me, I believe that the political parties must have institutions that must train their workforce, all right? Because that's the only way that we recruit leadership for the country, I should say, all right? If you go to corporate, you know, you go through managerial, you know, level, maybe you get through a line manager, etc. you become a corporate leader, right? Mm -hmm. Political party is the same. When you get to the, the base of it, maybe you are a, a foot soldier, you, you, raise, I mean, you rise through the ranks, you become a constituency, somebody, constituency chairman, etc. Eventually, maybe you become a minister. Sometimes you contest and you win elections, you become an MP, you rise mm -hmm. just like Nanado did, becomes a, a flag bearer, uh, just like Mama also did becomes well. a presidential candidate. It is the system that we recruit, all right, leaders into, you know, uh, I mean, we recruit leaders for the country, mm. which means that political parties have the responsibility 
to orientate their people, to let their people understand what is leadership, what is the relationship between their leadership, their kind of leadership, and the party ideology and the needs of the people. If you do not take that, that particular steps, deliberate steps, to equip, empower, to train your workforce, which is you know, from the rank and file of the political party, that's the kind of people you get. Mm, I see. Prof, I, I was going to you know, ask you how the citizenry could differentiate between complete rubbish of a promise and, you know, credible promise. Unfortunately, I'm out of time. And so I'm going to have to say thank you to you. I appreciate you talking to us uh, tonight. But also tonight, we are keeping the pressure on illegal and unethical mining, despite government's latest intervention. I'll tell you more, but you only know if you stay with us. Don't go away. Tonight, the fight against Galamsey may be getting somewhere after all. President Akufuado has put together an ad hoc committee, ministerial committee, to engage stakeholders on illegal mining. Here are the members of this, you know, very important committee. We know there are the National Security Minister, Albert Kandapa, as chairman of this committee. Other members include... Samuel Abu Jinapo, the Sector Minister, Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, Dominic Nitewo, uh, Minister for Defence, you recall Operation Vanguard, the Defence Ministry played a very critical role in that, we know what happened. Minister for Employment and Labour Relations and Pensions, Ignatius Bafwe Wua, and then the last member of the team, Minister for Information, Fatima Tu Abubakar. Now, this committee of powerful names is seven years, nine months, and 13 days too late. Comes at a time the president who had put his job on the line and promised to do the right thing but didn't, best case scenario, stumbled in tackling unethical and illegal mining. As a result, the miners have got more brazen. Tonight, we are learning that despite the renewed pressure and calls for a ban on all forms of small-scale mining activities, to protect our water sources. A new mining site has emerged where miners are busily sending the forest to an early death and turning the earth inside out. I'm talking about the Asenyanyo Forest Reserve within the Nkarie Forest District in the Ashanti region. Take a look at the very disturbing uh, pictures on your screens at the moment. The green is going away. We're seeing the brown earth. They are turning it over just so they can get the gold and the money they need and ruining our water bodies. And then the rest of us get sick, including them. But who cares? We'll make some gold at the end of the day, so we're all right. They're tilling and humbling the earth with these excavators. Well, in a tad, I'm going to speak to Abraham Essel, who is the Incaria Forestry District Service Division Manager. Um, well, my understanding is he's ready at the moment. Thank you so much, Abraham. Good evening to you. Uh, let's talk about the situation that you identified this morning. What do you know or what have you gathered about the owner of that I, I don't, I'm not even sure if I should call it a concession, but the owner of or the, the person behind that act, do, do we know who this is, this person is at the moment? Good evening and thank you for being on the program. Um, as we speak, uh, no one has shown up that he or she is behind the operations ongoing in that section of the forest reserve. And to the best of my we don't also have any documentation to that effect. And so for now, um, investigations are ongoing to, to try to unravel the uh, behind uh, that operation. Mm. So if the people just got up and then entered the forest, in your, your forest? Exactly so, exactly so, exactly so. We really? So the excavators? No, you can't tell me that. The excavators, they came through the main route. Enter the forest where you, you and your men are supposed to be, you know, guarding, so to speak, and started tilling the land. Look at the vast land they have tilled over a five-day period. How did that happen? 
Uh, okay, thank you very much for this opportunity. We had an information about a week and some few days ago that some armed guys have come to um, secure or exact portion of the forest reserve. And so the next day, I deployed my field staff to go and verify the situation. On reaching the scene, they saw that some barricades have been mounted, and uh, the guys manning the barricades are wielding offensive weapons. Mm. And, and so my guys were prevented from entering the reserve to see whatever has happened there or even undertake their lawful mandate. And so they reported this to me, and uh, I was shocked to the marrow because, I mean, that, that, this is not the norm. And so I decided to go and verify it myself. When I got uh, the barricade was in place, these armed guys approached me, and I told them, please, I want access to get into the forest, and then undertake my mandate. Uh, they asked me to wait a while. They will make some calls. And if they need me, they will allow me entry. And so after some few minutes, five to ten minutes thereabout, they granted access. But where we will park the car and walk into the forest, it's like 200 meters. Hmm. And so in walking through the forest to ascertain what has happened there, <laughs> I wasn't left alone to just go and do what I mandate. I was going under escort with guns and, you know, my Escorting me. So whilst we were working, we got to the boundary and I was told that this is the extent I could go. And so I should return. Wow. And uh, yes, looking at I mean the scene, I could do nothing than to comply. And so I retreated and later in fact when there is an illegal mining incident, you assess the situation and then you look at how you tackle it. So each instance and how you need to tackle it. There are instances where we deploy a big point in or some field officers and are able to deal with it. Very but this one looking at the preparedness of the people, we thought that this one we need to strategize and then find the best way mm. forward. And so we had to call on the police for them to advise us. Dicek had to even come in. Mm. But uh, there was no solution. And so we had to escalate to, to another level. So, to so if, if you market. say there was no solution, then it means that tomorrow morning we could find the excavators back in the forest. Is that the case? Uh, for now, uh, Nanano accompanied us with the necessary support, the traditional authority of the Inkari to accompany us to the site to yesterday. And uh, Nanano are too powerful that when they got there, all the people have responded. Uh, it was left with their equipment. I mean, there were some mining equipment, as in the ocean plants and all those things, yet to be installed. And so uh, Nananum went there, and they were afraid of Nananum's power. And so they responded. And right now, Nananum have put in place measures to wow. safeguard the place. Yes. Uh, Abraham, uh, so uh, are there any next steps that? You plan to take as the forestry, uh, you know, the protectors of our forest. Any next steps you're taking with DISEC? What, what next? Uh, if I heard you right, you are, you are, you are asking me uh, measures put in place by DISEC? No, I'm, I'm asking what next? What would you do next about the situation? Okay, very much. Thank you very much. Um, as it stands, um, we are counting on the support of all stakeholders, in particular... Mm. Uh, we will mention Nanando, who are the custodians of the land, and when they teach, it carries a lot of weight. Very and well. So right now, the overlord of the entire tool has uh, decreed that the countries within those enclaves should ensure, mm. should ensure that the forest over there is safeguarded. They should, they should put and co 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 coordinate with forestry so that we'll be able to secure. And so Nananum have uh, taken the matter. Very well. Uh, they have the crew that we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. Entry. Abraham, uh, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you for staying up uh, this late. Abraham uh, there is, you know, manager of the Incaria Forest uh, Service uh, Division, I, I believe. But I want to come to, into the studio. Dara Bosu is Deputy National Director of Arusha, Ghana. And uh, we, we're going to talk about this really disturbing situation. Mm -hmm. you, you saw the pictures. You had my conversation. I want to pick your initial thoughts on that.
Terminate. So, good evening, and um, I think I'm very happy to be here. I will start from the fact that that when the government failed to bring the law action against Akunta mining, mm -hmm. when they invaded Tano Numeri, that, that was when government opened the floodgates for this sort of impunity to continue to fester in the environment. Again, when the government itself took active steps to pass an ally that practically says, you can mine in all forests, as long as we deem it fit, mm -hmm. you can do that. That also became the doom of our forest reserves. And now you have seen this brazen act of impunity where they're even challenging the officers. Mm -hmm. It started with Akunta mining. They also mounted a barrier and the forestry service had to beg to enter the forest. And he's talking about armed, armed And these are, so practically people. you're putting our men and women who are also state agency actors who are protecting our forest reserve in danger. And you also say that, we've had the minister also talk about the fact that the people in the pit doing mining are also what contributed to Ghana's economy. These are officers also appointed by the state institutions set up by the constitution of Ghana to work in the interest of the state. And their job is to make sure they protect the forest, not only for today, but also in better conditions for future generations. Mm -hmm. So this kind of impunity should not be tolerated anywhere. And it's sad to see that this issue keeps happening day in and day out. And this is not the only forest reserve. Mm -hmm. There are several forest reserves that are also under siege. Mm -hmm. And I guess you have seen the statement from the Ghana Institute of Forested talking about how their lives are in danger as a result of this impunity. That mm -hmm. seems to be taking over the whole country. Mm -hmm. Today we have uh, the president putting together this ad hoc ministerial committee. As I indicated, you know, it's nine months uh, it is seven years, nine months, and 13 days late. But, you know, in the spirit of uh, the zeitgeist, or am I saying this right? You know, in the spirit of the moment, what are your impressions about this? I totally agree with you. This is too late. This is not the time to be talking. It's also a reflection that this government has not paid attention to all that is happening and they've never thought of really resolving this problem. If this is just about talking, that is not what we are demanding. We are asking for a state of emergency and all forms of mining, be it legal or illegal, around rivers and forest reserves to be halted and ceased. Equipment being used, ceased. And this is what we are asking. If this is just another talk time they are seeking to ask, mm -hmm. then we are not going to give them that because they, they only have up to the end of September. And that is where citizens are going to rise up and show them that you have taken us for granted for too long. Mm. And I think that where we are now, it is either we solve the problem now or we forget about it. Indeed. And so for us, we've heard of this committee. We are still not, we are not amused by it because we have also seen other statements mm -hmm. and positions being put out there by the Minister for Lands and also the Deputy. Indeed. And some of, it, some of them are very worrying. I mean, I don't recall any of the key messages coming from either organized labor or the media collusion with all the other NGOs talking about and banning small-scale mining. Nobody has said that. We have said emphatically that if you are mining in a forest reserve or in a river, you should cease and that should be halted. Mm -hmm. Whether it is legal or illegal, you yeah. have to stop it. Indeed. So I actually think that it's just a red herring they are throwing out there to confuse the debate and also the demands that civil society is asking. Will this stop you? Will this make you, um, you know, tamper a bit? Perhaps? No, as far as we are concerned, uh, organized labor and all of us, we are very resolute. And that is how come we, uh, we, we realize that this is the right moment to really push this case. And so we are going to stay committed to the cause and we want to see government show concern for the plight of Ghanaians. We see this as a crisis situation and it is sad to see they see another opportunity to just talk and talk. We are not going to tolerate that. Indeed. Uh, Dara, thank you so much for it's talking to us. It's been a pleasure. Us. Thank you. Dara thank Bosu, you so much. Indeed. Dara Bosu is Deputy National Director of Arusha Ghana. And we've been talking about the, you know, the, the death of our forests, which is also the death of us as a result of uh, illegal and unethical mining. We'll keep, the, we'll keep the pressure on here at TV3. But remember that on Sunday, you can join me in my conversation as we pick this up again 
with the uh, you know the chairperson of the National Commission on Civic Education. We had a great conversation on this. Hopefully, it's a starting point for you to know how you're playing a role in this. But tomorrow at 7 a.m., join Alfred and his panelists as they discuss this issue and many others. This is your election command center. This is also Ghana tonight. And uh, I'm going to have to say good night at this point. I'm out of time. But as always, a pleasure coming your, coming your way. Have a great weekend.